Welcome to everything you need to know about green bag appointments. I'm Rebecca Snyder with Executive Alliance. We're delighted to have you all here. I'd like to introduce Secretary Tisha Edwards, who is the appointment secretary um, for the Moore Miller administration. And now she's spotlighted, so no pressure, Tisha. Um, Tisha and I have known each other for, oh my gosh, a good long time because we were in the leadership, well, a couple decades ago. Um, so she has, through her, her work and her career, has really knitted together that public-private partnership. Um, she has been the interim CEO of the Baltimore City Public Schools, chief of staff to the mayor of Baltimore, president of Bridge EDU, and executive director of the mayor's office of children and family success. So Tisha does not shy away from taking on the big projects. Um, she's grown organization, she's restructured systems, she's put herself in, in opportunities and places that are not always comfortable, but always get the work done. And I feel like one of the most um, admirable things about, about Tisha, in addition to that, you know, huge resume, is her commitment to equity, to black and brown children and families, to making Maryland more inclusive and to bringing the talents together of all sorts of people. And so I feel like, you know, telling that narrative, this, this secretary appointment, I think is such a good fit for you, Tisha, because it allows you to do what you've done in the private and public sector writ large across the state of Maryland. So I'm really delighted to have you here. Um, and the state boards and commissions, Tisha will tell you more, but not enough people know and understand what is going on with boards and commissions. There's over 600 across the state of Maryland, statutorily um, mandated and with lots of um, opportunities. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Tisha, and you can get us started. Well, first of all, Rebecca, I'm so glad we recorded this because I'm sending your comments about me to my, I'm sending those comments to my mom because <laughs> I want her to know <laughs> uh, all of the things that I've been doing. Uh, so thank you so much for those kind words. Um, you summed it up about who I am, uh, why I'm so excited to be Governor Moore's Secretary of Appointments in this moment, uh, because one of the things that I have prided myself on and in my career is having a multiplier effect, right? Mm -hmm. Not one person can do it all. It's really about how do we uh, expand who's at the table and have more people on the field and more people doing the great work um, that's required for our communities. And in this particular role, that's exactly what I get up to do every single day is to identify highly competent highly qualified individuals who are passionate about the state, who are aligned with the Moore Miller administration and to give them the opportunity to serve. Um, our governor says that service will save us. And so this is a moment uh, where we, we're all hands on deck uh, for the state of Maryland. And I'm really excited to be the vessel uh, to bring those individuals uh, to the table. The other thing I will say before I go into my formal remarks, I'm especially excited about all the work that Rebecca and Team Executive Alliance is doing. We need more women uh, involved in state service. I was so surprised that there were so many boards still today that were 100% men, not a single woman at the table. That does exist in way too many places in our state, and that's completely unacceptable. And I see Executive Alliance as a critical partner in helping me, helping our governor, helping our lieutenant governor to marshal all of the wonderful, highly competent and capable women to get them involved in state service. So this is a real moment uh, for this administration and Executive Alliance. Uh, and I am leaning into your network to do all that I can to open the doors uh, and get more folks involved. So I'm really excited to be here and uh, I'm looking forward to doing much, much more uh, with Executive Alliance. I think there's a real value proposition in this work for the state but there's also a value proposition for the individuals who serve. It elevates your professional profile. It allows you to go deep into something that you really care about. And it allows you to be a part of uh, building government, building state government. And so this is a win, win, win. 
Um, and I wanna make sure that everyone who wants to participate has the opportunity to do so. So I'm gonna start, I'm gonna kick off my formal presentation with a little video. Uh, and then I'm going to go into a quick PowerPoint, and then I really want to create the opportunity for question and answers. I'm an open book, uh, and nothing's off the table, including talking about my sons, which I can talk about all day. Uh, but uh, I want to create a safe and open space to talk about uh, whatever it is that you think would be helpful in your journey uh, in terms of getting involved in state boards and commissions. And I am completely transparent about the things I've learned about this. I didn't really understand what this was all about when I took the job. And so I tell everyone, I think I've cracked the code. And so I'm really excited to share that information um, with, with you all. All right, so let's get started on the presentation. So while Tisha is setting up her, um, her tech, which is always a nerve wracking thing, I just wanted to give a plug for next, we, we get to have Tisha twice because next um, uh, Thursday, we'll have our in the room mentoring session, uh, which is an open uh, session in person at the Pikesville uh, Doubletree. And uh, you will be able to come and join us with small group mentoring sessions. So that's in the morning from 830 to 1030. And more information is on our website at executivealliance.org. All right, Tisha, you ready to hit play? Secretary of Appointments, it's my job to oversee 600 boards and commissions, to curate those boards and commissions, and put people in position to impact change for the state of Maryland. We inherited boards and commissions that were predominantly white, predominantly male, and predominantly representing Baltimore County and Anne Arundel County. The state is much richer than that, much more diverse than that. And so my appointments office has taken very seriously uh, this notion of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we needed it to create a process that allowed the grandmother, 60 year old, never done board service in, you know, Eastern Shore and some of our most engaged, politically savvy, super sophisticated experts to also engage. And we wanted them to come through the same door. Our work is year round, every day. We're always out there reviewing applications, recruiting more individuals to come into the administration and making great hires for the governor. And those are all individuals who represent us and who have our best interests at heart and will drive the Moore Miller administration's policies about equity, about excellence, about leaving no one behind, and ensuring that the state is ran by people who are representative of our democracy. All right, uh, now I'm gonna go into uh, more formal remarks. All right, can everyone see the presentation? Yes. All right. Okay, good, let's go. So uh, you saw this in the video. Uh, we've been very mission specific in this appointments office. I think that this mission is what makes us fundamentally different from any other appointments office, from e any 
previous administration. It's the thing that I'm most proud about is that we're a mission driven organization based on the mandate of Governor Moore and Lieutenant Governor Aruna Menor. We have three core principles associated with our mission. Number one, we need to expand access to board and commissions uh, to, for service on for all Marylanders, right? And we heard about this before. Uh, the boards were very, very uh, male dominated, um, very geographically centered, um, and we need to expand access. And part of expanding ac access is having conversations with folks like you all to make sure you're really aware of the opportunity, um, making sure that we have a transparent process uh, for everyone to apply and engage. And so we've tried to modernize uh, the appointments office We've tried to, again, increase that accessibility and do a lot of outreach in order to meet that goal. Uh, the second core uh, part of our mission is to attract the best possible talent to Maryland's boards and commissions. These are really, really important uh, tables to be sitting at. We take it very seriously. Uh, we look at qualifications. We're very, we scrutinize uh, who we're bringing to the table to make sure that they're qualified, uh, to make sure that there's some alignment. And when I say alignment, I want to make sure that I'm clear. This is not about being in one particular political frame. Uh, appointment making is bipartisan. Uh, we think there needs to be diversity of ideas, uh, but we also need to make sure that the folks that we bring into this process, as I said, are qualified, have, can bring rich, new, innovative perspective to state government, and, and most importantly, understand the seriousness of having a gubernatorial appointment. Um, and then finally, our, our job is to ensure membership on our boards and, and commissions represent the state. This is so important. Um, and it's so unfortunate that uh, for many, many years, that wasn't a priority. And so we're transforming and changing and holding ourselves accountable uh, to representation. Though there's data that I look at every, on every single board. I look at each board uh, and I ask myself every single day, who's missing from the conversation? And when I am reviewing the boards, making recommendations to the governor and to the lieutenant governor, I talk about the value proposition. This person will bring this perspective. This person uh, is brings a voice that we really, really need to be in the conversation. So that value proposition is a part of the conversation and representation is always a part of the conversation when we are making appointments. Uh, one of the things I'm really proud of is that we are really engaging women uh, in this process. In 2023, um, our team made 2,000 appointments. Um, and within that group of individuals that Governor Moore appointed to boards and commissions, 52% of them uh, were women and 28% of them were women of color. Uh, and there's still a lot of work to be done. I told Rebecca when we started, I was amazed that there were still boards and commissions that were all men, 100% men. Um, and that to me is completely unacceptable. Um, and so again, I'm always looking at the data. I'm always looking for representation and very proud of the progress uh, that we've made thus far. Thus far. Um, I'm also very proud of the fact that the appointments office is also responsible for supporting the, the process of the appointment of the governor's cabinet. Uh, we run the recruiting process. We run the vetting process. We are partners uh, and serve the governor in terms of bringing forward final recommendations for his cabinet. Uh, and I was just over the moon excited that our cabinet, when we started the administration, has been um, called the most diverse cabinet in the state's history. Uh, again, 54% of our cabinet are people of color, 50% are women, and 29% of the governor's cabinet are women of color. Uh, that is important because it has a multiplier effect that gets us more representation at the agency leadership level 
uh, and then that ensures that their teams, their executive teams, their overall workforce also is more representative, more diverse, more inclusive. So this is a body of work that has a huge impact. Uh, I always smile when the governor says the appointments office, we are the architect of rebuilding government under his administration. It's something that we hold very dear um, and it's something that we work on every single day. Uh, and as I said from day one, the Moore Miller administration recognized the critical need to amplify the voices of women in leadership roles uh, by ensuring women are represented in our government and we're committing to a future where no one is left behind. I mean, we take that mandate from the governor very seriously. You'll hear me talk about it more, but at the end of the day, that's what I'm looking for. Who are other people who want to be a part of the commitment to leave no one behind? Uh, just in terms of what do these boards and commissions do? They're very powerful, uh, very influential seats um, and do a lot of important work on behalf of Marylanders every single day. Um, our boards and commissions oversee, regulate, and support uh, the state's professions and industries. They guide policy and state action on major issues that impact uh, residents the most. Um, they also provide a platform for the broader community to have a voice and participate in government decision making. Lots of people say to me all the time, I want to su support this administration. But I have a really great job and I don't want to leave my job, but I want to be on the team. Well, guess what? Boards and commissions allow you to be a part of the administration. Uh, and so it's a wonderful way uh, to be engaged and be a part of the moment uh, of the Moore Miller administration. Um, we also see boards and commissions as important resources to expand the expertise and capacity of state government. Um, this is a democracy. And absolutely, we have folks who work for state government full time, uh, but they need help uh, and perspective. Uh, and so participating on a board and commission allows you to bring your lived experience, allows you to bring your professional experience from industry into and influencing state government. And so it's a wonderful partnership uh, and it's a wonderful opportunity to help those of us who are in the house, uh, make sure that we are gaining as much information from our constituents from the community and so that we don't lose that uh, when we're doing the work on behalf of Marylanders. So one of the things I think that people need to know, um, and Rebecca spoke to this, and I also alluded to it in uh, my presentation, is that we have 600 boards and commissions. And what's interesting about that 600 boards means 6,000 appointments. 6,000 people are serving on boards and commissions every single day. That's a huge uh, opportunity uh, to bring folks into the work with us. And I think that sometimes people focus on just a few of those boards and commissions that you read about in the paper or you hear your friends talking about. One of the things that I learned is the scope of boards and commissions, 600 of them. Um, and so I wanted to give uh, this group an example or some examples of the types of boards and commissions that are out there that you have the opportunity to apply for and ultimately become engaged in. The governor has said that he has four main goals for this administration. Um, we want to make Maryland safer. We want to make Maryland more affordable. We want to make Maryland more competitive. And we don't want to make Maryland the state that serves. And basically, when I look at boards and commissions, you can find a board or commission that allows you to fit anywhere within that framework, right? So these are just examples to give you a sense and to get you thinking about what's available. Uh, but we have the Governor's Family Violence Council. Um, this is a commission that provides information on family violence with recommendations on how to redu reduce and eliminate uh, abusive behaviors. 
Uh, we have a Maryland Police Training and Standards Commission. Uh, this is a board that governs police certification and training in our state. Um, we have examples of boards, if you want to be a part of uh, helping to make Maryland more affordable, um, our Prescription Drug Affordability Board, very important board, uh, which is the state's policy board in thinking about how we lower the cost of prescription drugs uh, for Marylanders. Um, we also have the Maryland Housing Trust, uh, the Affordable Housing Trust. Uh, very important board. The governor just passed a huge housing package um, to address the rising cost of housing in the state of Maryland. If you want to be a part of that, if you have perspective that you can bring uh, to that conversation, uh, we have this, this housing trust, which is a great opportunity to get involved. Um, we also committed to making Maryland more competitive. And so we have boards uh, where we're always looking for experts in that area. We have the Maryland Economic Development Commission, which establishes the state economic development policy and oversees the state's efforts to create, attract, and retain businesses and jobs. We also have the Governor's Workforce Development Board, which helps to plan, coordinate state programs and services uh, to increase uh, the state's workforce uh, across many, many different professions. And we have all kinds of industry experts serving on that board. And then, of course, we have the governor's commitment to ensure that we are a state that serves. We have the Commission on Service and Volunteerism, which is the commission that supports the Department of Service and Civic Innovation, which is a new agency created by this governor. And so that board is the governing board for that particular agency and all of the work that they're doing with young people across the state of Maryland. And then, you know, we also have our Maryland's Veterans Trust Fund, um, which is a board of directors that administers um, resources and assistance to veterans and their families uh, who need support. So this just gives you an, an example of like all the different ways, you name it, we have a board for it. Um, and so there's just so many different ways that we all can be involved in and uh, support this administration's agenda. One of the things you have to pay attention to when you're pursuing a board is what are the statutory requirements of the board. This is how we decide whether a person is qualified. And so this slide gives you a sense. What happens is the boards are created through statute and the statute dictates who the General Assembly was looking for to be in these conversations. So the State Board of Physicians is a really uh, specific board. It has 22 members associated with it. And look at the, the kinds of backgrounds that we're looking for. We're looking for uh, licensed physicians. We're looking for uh, representation from the health department. We're looking for a physician assistant. We need to make sure we have somebody from Johns Hopkins University on the board. We need to make sure we have somebody from the University of Maryland School of Medicine on the board. Five consumer members. Consumer members are in, in interesting seats on boards because these are individuals basically who are bringing their lived experience. That's really what a consumer member is. It is a person who's had an issue with um, care in the state of Maryland, and they can bring that perspective to this board. It can be an advocacy person who is all about physicians uh, being transparent about their billing practices or transparent, more transparency in the services that they provide. Uh, you, we can we bring lived experience. That's what consumer members mean. So we're always looking in people's profile and their experiences and their volunteer work and saying, look, this person has an interesting perspective that they can bring to the physicians board. Uh, and we're all and we also for this board have to have a public member for the Maryland Hospital Association. So we then go into our database and we start looking at resumes. And we're going to talk more about how you build your resume to speak to the qualifications. But once I know, okay, I need to find people for the physician's board, 
And for those of you that may or may not know, the Physicians Board is who regulates doctors in the state of Maryland. So if someone has a complaint, if someone is not following their regulations around how they prescribe um, medications in the state of Maryland, all of this is regulated by the Physicians Board. Um, and I'll tell you a, a quick story about an equity issue um, and why representation matters. We received a lot of doctors, uh, doctors of color, that said that they were being disciplined more by the physician board than other doctors, doctors who were not doctors of color, right? They said people, the, the physician's board didn't understand the practice. They didn't understand um, how they did billing. They didn't understand the needs of the communities that they were working in. And so they were getting these, they were, they were being sanctioned more because they did not have representation on the physician's board who understood their practices and their practice in community and their pr practice serving uh, folks who have real challenge, real health challenges. And so, you know, p physicians of color reached out to us and said, you've got to diversify and you've got to bring broader perspective to the boards of physicians because of this sanctioning issue. And I wouldn't have thought about that as being a issue uh, around equity and fairness, um, but it comes up in all of these regulatory boards, the dentist board, the social workers board, like we find that there's systemic bias uh, in a lot of our regulations and policies. And in order to address those systemic issues, you need to have people on these boards and commissions who can educate and point out and bring awareness to where those inequities exist. And so that representation really, really does matter. And it was something I didn't really fully understand until we got the outreach and then we, we, we brought more representation to uh, uh, the Board of Physicians. And uh, that was just a really cool example. I was like, oh, this does make sense. Um, another board, again, giving you some examples of the types of statutory requirements associated with these boards. Um, this is the Maryland Economic Development Commission. Um, and look at this board's requirements compared to the State Board of Physicians. This board the General Assembly really felt it was important to have geographic representation so that the economy of the entire state is taken into consideration. So when we're making appointments, we're looking at who are really qualified people in the Eastern Shore, who are really qualified people in the Lower Shore or Calvert and Charles and St. Mary's because they are a part of the state's economic strategy and we don't wanna leave them behind. We don't want just the big eight counties driving economic policy and Maryland's competitiveness strategy. We need to make sure everybody's at the table. So a lot of times we have these geographic requirements and we're specifically, I'll say, pull all of the applications of folks from the Eastern shore who are interested in this board. I'm only gonna look at folks from the Eastern Shore because they that's a, that's a need that we have and it's a statutory requirement. Uh, what we find, and I talked about this in the video, is that we find in our larger metropolitan areas, lots of applications, lots of applications for folks from Baltimore City or Montgomery County, especially Montgomery County, Prince George's County, Baltimore County. Uh, we see a lot of folks who know about what we do and they apply. We have to go and beat the streets um, to get our rural counties uh, in, engaged in the process. And so there's always a wonderful opportunity if you live outside of those, the big eight, um, that's really, that's a population of individuals that we wanna make sure that they're seated at the table. And in many cases, statute requires that. So uh, another thing I want to make sure that folks understand, you hear a lot of talking about the green bag. And so I want to talk a little bit about what the green bag is and how the green bag only represents a very small percentage uh, of the work that we do. Uh, newsflash, we do appointment making year round, not just during legislative session. Uh, the green bag 
it has a historical context and it really is only the boards and commissions that require Senate confirmation. So I have 600 boards and commissions, only 192 of the 600 require Senate confirmation. So the green bag and during the legislative session is when we are working very hard to get folks who have to go through Senate confirmation into the process, applications approved, signed off for the, by the governor and, and submit their names to the General Assembly because they have to go through the executive nominations confirmation process. Great thing that we do, it's the thing everybody talks about, but it's only 192 boards out of 600. So very small segment of the entire portfolio. And that's the work that we work on during session is the green bag. Um, then we have what we call general appointments, which are same thing, boards and commissions, but do not require Senate confirmation. The governor has unilateral authority without the General Assembly weighing in to make general appointments. That's where 400 of our boards and commissions are considered general boards and commissions. That's where the super majority of the seats are. And in my opinion, where some really great um, expertise is really, really needed for our general board. So that's where the majority of our appointment making happens. From May to December, we are focused on these general appointments. That's what our team is working on right now. Uh, and as I said, the only difference is that it does not require uh, Senate confirmation. Uh, so this was a, a really uh, important post that I wanted to share with this group about why, you know, my why, and I, I really do appreciate Rebecca for lifting up my profile, uh, but I only took this job if it were an opportunity to expand opportunity for others. That's the only thing that gives me kind of the inspiration and motivation that I personally need. And I saw the Office of Appointments under this particular governor as an extraordinary, extraordinary opportunity uh, to open the doors and, and, and really to bring power uh, people into the power framework uh, for policies that are being made. And uh, one of the really proud appointees that we made in our first year was of Nakia Drummond. And she wrote this very personal uh, post that really is kind of my why and really I rally my team around this because we need to see people, we need to understand what this is really about. Um, and so uh, Nakia is uh, really excited. She's in yellow standing next to her mother. She brought her son and her husband uh, to her swearing in. And in her post, she said, my family has lived in Maryland for as back as we have been able to trace from Talbot County to Baltimore. We've been here since the mid 1800s. My family's blood, sweat and tears are part of Maryland's legacy, its richness. It's my honor, my right, my legacy to join Maryland's Economic Development Commission and ensure that families like mine have opportunities with generational impact sworn in. And that just says it all to me that this brilliant African-American woman who, you know, she talks about like, this is my state. Uh, I have history here, I have roots here. And she now is at the table for driving the state's uh, Economic Development Commission and economic strategy. And this is her first uh, statewide seat. Uh, it meant a lot to her. It meant a lot to our administration but she exemplifies our why. And we wanna we wanted bring more people who understand the assignment uh, to this work. 
The other thing I wanted to really uh, say is that this work is not just about representation. And it really frustrates me when people make the work of diversity uh, and they don't talk about qualifications, right? Uh, we are uh, appointing some of the most qualified and diverse individuals to our boards and commissions. And we are not sacrificing experience and expertise for diversity. It's, it's offensive for people to say that these women uh, and people of color don't have the qualifications uh, to be on these boards and commissions because they do. I screen these applications personally. The governor screens the applications personally. Uh, and we are making sure that our boards and commissions uh, and that our appointees really bring value to the work. And so I just thought it was important to lift up the kinds of profiles that we're looking, looking at and looking for. Uh, we were very excited to appoint Taylor Lilly to the Chesapeake Conservation Corps Program Board. She's a lawyer from the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. She's had a strong background in environmental justice and conservation. And she was featured in the Baltimore Business Journal's list for 40 under 40, young, professional, dynamic woman, very well qualified, is also a woman, is also a person of color, uh, but obviously has the bona fides uh, to be on this board. Uh, we also uh, appointed recently Ray Oliveira, uh, to the Fire Rescue Education and Training Commission, which was a very male dominated board because it's in the, the fire space where we don't have a lot of women uh, at the executive level. So we were super excited to appoint her 30 years experience in nursing and EMS, um, served as the training division chief in Hartford County. So we love the fact that we were able to bring someone from one of our more rural counties um, into uh, the appointments process and just has a strong track record and expertise in training and recertifying emergency services uh, and, and EMS professionals. So again, we, we, we do this with a really uh, rigorous point of view. We think that there are some exceptional women uh, in the state of Maryland who are more than qualified uh, to be in these conversations and we work very hard to bring them forward and put them on our boards and commissions. Very quickly, um, let's talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of actually submitting your application. I went to my placement team and I asked them, tell, crack the code for me. Tell me some of the do's and don'ts uh, when you're filling out your appointments application. Um, and they did a great job of giving us some, some things to think about. You want to demonstrate uh, that you're aligned with the values. This is not about political uh, affiliation. That's not what we're communication, communicating. It's that commitment to leaving no one behind. It's that commitment uh, to seriousness around the really challenging uh, decisions that many of the boards and commissions are making. It's demonstrating that you are ready uh, and can take on this responsibility because it, it requires meetings, it requires preparing, it requires uh, engagement. And so we, we're looking for that in our candidates. Um, find where your background fits. Uh, when you submit your resume, when you submit your application, we're doing a paper screen. And so we need to see you and your why in your documentation. So don't be shy. That's another thing I tell women. We, we, don't, we don't talk about all the great things we've done, the awards we've received, you know, everything you've done in your child's school, everything that you've done in your community, at your church, and all of these associations that we are a, a part of. So make sure that we can see when we're looking at the board qualifications, I'm looking for matching you based on this paper review. So I need to see your qualifications. 
Uh, we need to see your demographic ba background. We need to know if you have unique experience or lived experience. If it's not professional and it's more in your personal space, make sure you highlight that in some way uh, so that we can see it. Your passions. You know, some people don't put that on professional resumes anymore. If you have passions or hobbies, there's nothing wrong with listing that so that we can help that can help us. Uh, make the match. Highlight your community involvement, nonprofit organizations, professional orders uh, and citations, all of the volunteering that we all do or have done all of our lives. I need to see the full view of like who you are and what you do. And so take the time uh, to make sure that your, rep your resume reflects that story. Now, when you upload your resume, and we'll talk about it, it has to be a PDF document. What some people do, and you can only upload one document, one thing that people have done that we find helpful is they'll upload their resume and they'll include their cover letter in the PDF, the one PDF. And that's where they tell, their, tell me their story. Uh, I'll give you an example. I had a woman who wanted to be on the caretakers commission. And her resume, I could not understand what value she would bring to the caretakers commission. This is the commission that's figuring out how do we support uh, people who are caring for their families in home? And what are the policies we need to do? What kind of resources we need to do? And so what she did is she did a cover letter that told me the story of how you know, for the past decade, she'd been caring for her mother who uh, was suffering from dementia and how the state really didn't have a support system for her, that she had ran into all of these challenges trying to get the kind of care, how that impacted her career, uh, and that she was really passionate about serving the community of caregivers who are caring for loved ones, whether they're disabled, whether they're elderly, uh, whatever the case may be. And it was through her cover letter, not her resume, that I could understand why it was so important to app appoint her to that commission. So if you, if it's not clear in your resume, but there's a story you want to tell, there's an experience you've had, um, tell us that in a cover letter, but make it part of the resume, like one PDF document, because you can't, uh, you can't have two. Um, you also can apply for up to 10 boards under a single application. That's really important uh, because, uh, again, you saw those statutory requirements. So you might not fit one board because of statute constraints, but there might be another board that we can find a, a, a real time match for. So helping us know the, the scope of your interest helps us in the matching process. Um, and always double check the information on your application. You go through a vetting process when you are shortlisted for an application. And so you need to be submitting the most up-to-date resume, all of the application questions, because we are doing a background vet and we're comparing what you say in your application to what's coming up in our background vet. So we need to make sure we have really up-to-date and accurate information. The don'ts, don't minimize your skills, women. We really have to work on that. I have to work on that. We're way too modest. We're way too humble. This is time to brag. This is time to showcase. This is time to take credit. This is time to tell your story. So please don't minimize your skills. We're looking for you. I just need you to communicate it to us. Um, you don't need to reapply uh, unless you want to be considered for more than 10 boards, um, which we tell you 10 is enough, uh, but we can use one application to screen you for 10 boards at a time. But if you change your mind and you wanna take something down and add something up, you can do that. Um, whenever possible, please don't skip the optional steps in the application process. Uh, any additional information helps us to effectively place you on the boards. It is optional, so if you're not comfortable, don't, but it is helpful uh, because it's just additional information that helps us to build out your profile. Uh, don't, we talked about this, don't upload a simple or blank resume. I'm looking for professionalism. I'm looking for qualifications. You want a spell check, you want to, your formatting matters. This is a part of your profile that we build. And so we're looking at 
Uh, it doesn't have to be graphically designed. That's not what I'm talking about, but it does need to be a professional document. Um, and as I said before, we it's important that we not have outdated information. Sometimes we're appointing you based on the job that you currently have. Um, so if you haven't worked that job and your resume is outdated or if you've left that job, I need to know that. Or I'm appointing you because you live in the Eastern Shore uh, and you meet the qualifications of the board, but I'm specifically looking for someone in the Eastern Shore and now you are living in DC. That is a problem, right? And so make sure that we have updated information. This is what our application looks like. Uh, you can go to our website, govappointments.maryland.gov. It's really easy. It only takes about 20 minutes uh, to complete uh, an application. You must create an account and have a log on. I know that's what everybody needs is another log on in their life, but you got to do it. Uh, and it, it is very clear about all of the information that you provide, need to provide. Recommendations are helpful, but not necessary. So if you have people, you're going to ask for, the application is going to ask for references. You need to have references. That's important. I always check to see who your references are. Sometimes we call, sometimes we don't. Sometimes our network knows your network. And so putting your references in your application is important. But you also have the option of having recommendations sent. That is not required, but can be helpful. So if you I have folks that can tell a story about why they recommend you, right, that are validators of your work, they can submit a recommendation on your behalf. If you have your council folks, your mayor, your delegate, your senators, if you want them to submit a recommendation, the way you do that is through the recommendation form. It is not, it is not going to disqualify if you don't have a rec recommendation. We have a lot of people that are new to this process. They say, I'm not connected to anybody, but I want to serve. You know what? I kind of have a heart for those people. So that's okay. But if you do have folks and you say, you know what, I volunteered at this organization and, and it's not on my resume, but I want them, I want this person to support my process, um, you can add them. But they do need to go through this process. And this is why your log on is so important, because we match the email that they give us for you and your application email to the recommendation. So there's a back end matching process. So uh, that's optional, <clears throat> but I wanted you to know it's available. <clears throat> the other thing, excuse me, that <clears throat> I want you to be aware of is this board list. If you want to know uh, what all the boards and commissions are, there are 600. This document is 230 pages long, sorry. But if you click the board list, that will tell you all the boards and commissions and what the statutory requirements are. So if you want to get to that level of detail and want to make sure you're a good match and it's the thing you really want to do, please uh, go to that board list. <clears throat> Finally, uh, we could not end this presentation without a picture of Governor Westmore and our team and really sharing with you what his mandate has been for his appointments office uh, and our why. And so this is the amazing appointments team. Uh, everything we do here is all about teamwork. I don't do it my, alone. This is the great group of folks who review your applications, take your questions. Uh, and, and what our governor has said is, I made a commitment to Marylanders that we would create a government that looks like the state of Maryland. And I am thrilled to say that our Office of Appointments has followed through on that promise. So this is, in his own words, uh, what our work is. And this is the team uh, that's doing great work every single day. And then here is our QR code. I'm so fascinated by the fact that I can put a QR code on the screen. And then you can like put your phone up like magic, seriously. So here are the QR codes. Uh, my, my staff says this is what everybody uses now. So here you go. 
uh, here are our QR codes to follow up with us uh, and to get involved. So that's it for me. Took way longer than I expected. I hope though that this was helpful. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Sorry, I'm muted. So thank you so very much for um, for sharing your knowledge. That was an incredible tour de force of really um, a very large and complex topic. Uh, so while our participants are thinking. Did Rebecca freeze. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can hear you, <laughs> Rebecca. I'm sure she'll, she'll be back in a minute. Come back in. <laughs> that was great to shut up. Thank you. It was so very much. helpful. Yeah. Any questions from anyone while we're waiting on Rebecca? I have a question. Oh, oh, go, ahead. Oh, go ahead. Oh, we. Is that okay, Violet? Come on. It is Violet. Hey, why don't you go? Hey, Violet, how are you? <laughs> What's your question? Um, I've, I've served before, and I have to tell you, it was one of the best experiences I've ever had. Great. Um, I was appointed to the Maryland Legal Services Corporation Board, and um, it is, I didn't even realize the level of influence I would have. So I really encourage people all the time. I talk about this all the time. So I'm out there promoting this, and you don't even know it. So with that said, my question is, having served before, um, will it hurt my chances of serving again? Absolutely not. Um, you should apply. Uh, what I will tell you, uh, which I think is an important point that you raised, number one, no, it does not. Uh, and I think it's great that you've had that experience because you know what to expect. Um, and what we say to people is like, what I get a little, what I encourage people to do is try different things, right? I have some people who've been on these boards for 10 years and I'm, all, and I'm always like, give someone else a turn and let's find something else for you to do. Let's keep it fresh. Let's, let's, we want to have some of that historical information, but we also want to maximize the opportunity for people to serve. What I will tell you that is a little different in our administration than previous administrations is that you are only uh, afforded one gubernatorial appointment at a time. So we do check to see if you are serving currently on another board as a gubernatorial appointee. Now, if you're serving through your association, that's fine. If you're serving and you got it through the speaker or through the Senate president, that's also fine. But we ask that folks only have one gubernatorial appointment. Why do we do that? Because we need to get more people access. And one of the things that we were finding is like, people were like, I want this. It was like, Oprah, give me this board. Give me that board. Give me this board. Give me that board. And that's kind of good. But what that meant is that other people were not giving the opportunity. So when we talked about expanding access and making this a little uh, more fair and more transparent, um, is that we've asked that folks limit their gubernatorial appointments to one board at a time. Now, we do make some special um, uh, exceptions. I've had to do that, particularly uh, in high need, high demand areas. But the general rule is one board at a time. Uh, but to your specific question, Violet, past service is a good thing. So please apply if there's something you're interested in doing. Okay, thank you so much. And I apologize, I had an internet error, so I popped off for a moment, but I see you guys have been chugging through, my apologies. Um, and just looking through the chat, um, I don't know if Anissa Caldwell, Washington's question about age, have you covered that? So Anissa, let's, don't even get me talking about age, okay? Like that's the thing <laughs> that I, is another area of opportunity. Absolutely, we need, all of Maryland represented on these boards and commissions and having the full spectrum of experience, young professionals, mid-career executives, people who are retiring. We only get it right when everybody's at the table. And so we've actually done a lot to recruit and bring young professionals into this space. 
It's a great place for a consumer when, when we, again, remember I said these consumer roles are lived experience roles. That's important. Um, what I'm looking for is not age. What I'm looking for is value add. How are you adding value to the conversation? Do, what have you done? You've got to, you know, you've got to show me that you've had some connection to this work. What we don't necessarily want is it's your first time serving on a board of commission and we put you in a position that it takes too much time or it's not a good fit, but we are actively looking for applicants across the full spectrum of experiences, age, and all demographics. So, so we would love to have much more, many more young professionals serving on our boards and commissions. So thank you for asking that question. Terrific. Um, and Lisa uh, Hayes had a question about general time commitment, recognizing that it may be different depending on the board. And then we'll end with Pam Love, who has her hand raised. Okay. So Lisa, that's really important. Um, all of our boards have an attendance requirement. The one thing that can happen is if you're appointed to a board and you're not uh, attending uh, according to that board's uh, specifications in their bylaws, you can be asked uh, to resign because of lack of engagement and lack of attendance. And you are right. Every board is different. We have some boards that only meet quarterly. We have some boards that meet every two weeks. We have some boards that meet once a month. So it really depends. What I would say to you, the way you figure this out, is I said to you, go on that webpage where it looks, where it tells you all of your boards and commissions that you can apply for. If you Google the name of that board, usually the webpage associated with that board and its organization comes up. And usually the executive director or point of contact for that board is also listed. Doing your due diligence is really important. And the one thing, I don't care what the board is, whether it's a state board, a nonprofit board, or for-profit board. The worst thing a person can do when they are uh, invited to join a board or commission is not to be able to fulfill the commitment. So you do want to do your due diligence. You can get some if you if you ever want to have a conversation, send us an email. You know, we can connect you to people if that's easier for you, but we encourage every applicant to do their due diligence because the time commitment varies. And for some of these boards, it's a serious time commitment. So for some, not as much, uh, but it does vary board by board. Thanks. Thank you for that. Pam, would you like to come off of mute and ask your question? Sure. Good morning and thank you for your presentation. It was very, very helpful. Right. I currently serve on the Family Violence Council and I believe my term uh, comes to an end this year. So as part of that, do I need to reapply or what happens in order if I'm interested in staying on the board? Because it's been such an invaluable experience. So first of all, thank you for your service, Pam. I'm glad that it's been a good experience and that we are really ratcheting that specific board up. This is a particular board of interest for our Lieutenant Governor. We have a new executive director for uh, the agency that is driving that board. And so you're gonna see an uptick uh, in engagement and commitment level required because it's something that this governor and this administration is very focused on. Yes. If you are interested in being reappointed, you should go in and you should uh, have an application on file. What we also do, Pam, is that we reach out before we do reappointments, we reach out to the executive directors and the points of contact and we ask them for their um, recommendations around reappointment. So you should also let your point of contact know, hey, if the governor's office reaches out to you or my term is coming to an end, I want to continue to serve, and I hope that I have your vote of confidence to do that, and please share that with the appointments office, and we take that into uh, consideration. So fill out the application, but also send a note or have a conversation with your executive director to let them know that you want to continue to be engaged. This is the other thing I would tell folks. It's always at the pleasure of the governor. So don't get mad at us if we're not able to re reappoint you. What I always tell people, if you're not reappointed for that board, come back to us and say, but I still want to serve. Let's find something else for me to do. So sometimes 
people, when we don't do reappointments, people think, did I do something wrong? No, sometimes there's a different experience we need. We're trying to bring some representation from other places. It has nothing to do with whether you were good, bad, or indifferent. The governor has just made the decision. He wants to refresh. But that doesn't mean that you can't do other things. So please get ahead of it. Communicate what you want. Uh, but also know if for any reason you're not reappointed, continue to stay with us because we will find another place for you to serve. And that's why we ask that you give us 10 boards and commissions that you're interested in it because there's always something to do. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Keisha, thank you so much for your candid and really fulsome answers to these questions and sharing your expertise. Thank you for to all of our participants. Um, as we wind down, I just wanted to appreciate the time that you spent with us today. Um, note that you can interact with Tisha in person next week at In the Room Mentoring and with other Executive Alliance uh, mentors. I know Pam Love is going to be a, a mentor, as is Violet Apple, uh, Sarah Mogul, who was on the call. Lots of great, great women sharing their skills and expertise. This is also not the last time you'll hear from the Secretary's Office or from Executive Alliance. We will share your contact information with the Secretary's Office so you can um, be added to their newsletter uh, and keep abreast of what's going on in the Appointments Office. And we invite you to um, consider Executive Alliance as we uh, have programming throughout the year. Um, we also focus on our own mentoring program, Applications will close in, in June, and we look forward to seeing you at an upcoming event. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you all. It's, it's been thank great. You. Thank you, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. Anytime. Thanks. Bye-bye.